putting me to the test um, because I don't know what's coming. <laughs> I say, and I'm a, I say I'm a delayed action person. I always remember afterwards. What well, you can you can say. take your time. <laughs> you can you can definitely take your time. Yeah. And um, anything you don't know or don't remember, just say. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. You can um, cut, you can cut it out always. Exactly. Yeah. This is the funny thing with interviews is. Um, my girlfriend has been doing quite a few interviews recently because we, we run a festival yeah. and we've, we won an award and so people want to interview her yeah. and um, she always comes back saying oh it was awful and you know I said all these stupid things and I ummed and ahed through the mm -hmm. whole thing and then the interview comes back yeah. and it's three little bits which yeah. were perfect yeah. and she looks brilliant and yeah. like she's been media trained yeah. and it's just funny like that yeah so, I think the first thing would be, could you just introduce yourself? Who are you? Uh, where did you come from? And, and what do you do in life? Yeah. And um, just basically who you are. Who I am. Well, I'm Josephine Langley. I'm the eldest girl of a family. But our parents were Londoners. We were Londoners. But when they married, in, they moved out into... Kettering in Northamptonshire, and there they had the family of four boys and four girls. One little boy died when he was two and a half, so we were left. And uh, we were Christian and Catholics, and very that was very important in our family. So we brought up in Kettering, and uh, went to school. I went to school in Northampton, at the convent school in Northampton, and we had a very uh, happy home life, very happy, but. Um, we didn't travel very far when I was young, so by the time I went to college, I went to training college. In those days, we had two-year training college for teachers. I'm back now. I was born in 1919, so in 1937, I was in college, and I came to London for that. And there, we had very good training in those days for for teachers. And so that was when I came first of all to live in London. But by that time. My brother was being, eldest brother was being trained for the priesthood in Birmingham. And I, we travelled as far as Birmingham in the west from the Midlands and to Heacham on the Wash for our holidays. And that was as far as, uh, as we, I had travelled. But then when I was in, when I, after I, I finished college, then I, did, I taught for a year in, that coincided with the opening with the beginning of the Second World War. So when I went to, I taught in a Market Harbour, in a small Catholic school in Market Harbour, but because of the uh, evacuation of children, it quickly became very big with the extra uh, children from London. And the same happened in my hometown, where we, we had a big house, of, a five-bedroom house for the children, but in the second year of the war, 1940, I had decided that my vocation in life was to be a missionary. So in 1940, I entered with a missionary congregation and left. My eldest brother was ordained a priest in Birmingham. My second brother married my school friend, Eva, and left. And my youngest brother, who was the, after the four girls came the youngest brother, he went away to boarding school, so the big house was emptied, and of course the evacuee officers came around, <laughs> and spare bedrooms filled up, and that was when your grandmother came and Joy lived in that, our house. So the house, my mother was of Irish descent, she was a Sullivan, very open, and open house and with all the evacuated children, and we had three Catholic schools that came up from North London. It was all go during the war. They had a wonderful time. They had an open house for the children and for the chaplains there. They all found a home in this house. So that was, but I had left in 1940. So after that, I was brought up in, in the novitiate in the, down in Coldash in Berkshire. So I knew very little of what was going on in those times because I was in training. That was the background mm -hmm. until I entered. 
I was born in 1919, which makes me 97, and I'm the eldest girl. My family's, um, the Langley family, have lived in, come from London for at least 300 years. We've been, lived in London. My mother was uh, a Sullivan. Her father was uh, one of the who came over from Ireland with the potato famine with absolutely nothing. Joined the British Army, so never had any contact with his family after that, and was sent out to India and so on. And married then. Uh, 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 he must have been um, in the barracks at Head at Reading, and married uh, a, a lady there, Greenaway, who was uh, the daughter of the local pub, being an Irishman. <laughs> and so, but he, and then she died after. They had, they had four children and she died. My mother never knew her, her mother. She was the youngest. So my grandfather had to bring them up on their own. So she had very little formation. She was brought up in convents like that. But they married my father and then they had eight children. And uh, the eldest was born in, uh, in 1914, in the opening of the war. But they moved out. When they married, they moved out of London. and. Uh, so the family were brought up in Kettering in Northamptonshire. And and how how have you lived your life, and how do you live your life now? What what's your life been about? My my life, I was called as we we're Catholics. And I was knew that my vocation was to be a missionary. And if you know anything about vocations in life, it's it's what you're called to do, and you're made to do. God, it's not what I wanted, as it were when I was a young person, but I felt this is what I was called to do. And I've been absolutely wonderful life, the result. I've been all over the world <laughs> in various, called here and there. I always feel myself, I'm a stopgap person. I've always, <laughs> when somebody's needed somebody, I've come into that. But I was a trained teacher, and in actual fact, I've done very little teaching in my life odd years I've done, but I've been in education. And now um, I've returned, having been travelling a lot, I've returned to this country after, uh, in 82, I settled down back. So I've been back in England since 82. And then once again, because of the needs of our different convents here, I've moved around and I've never stayed in any house in my life longer than 12 years. And then I was in Brixton in London for 12 years. That's the longest place I've ever stayed. When was that? I was in Brixton from um, 92 till 2004. Did you like Brixton? I very much. And I worked then in the... When, that was one of the, the one things that I liked doing, I enjoyed doing the most, was the... I worked in the prison ministry. I worked in, um, I started off in High Down and Downview, and then I went, most of the time I was in Wandsworth, and then a couple of years at the end, I went to Brixton Prison and worked there. But previously, when I'd first come back, I was up in March in Cambridgeshire, and uh, there they were opening Whitemore Prison, which is a high, top security prison now, and I was there for the opening of that, and I did my training there as a as a, a chaplain. There, that was. And so, in it, your life has been made up of lots of different chapters. Chapters, yeah. It feels like yes. So, which I suppose if if you could. What, what are those chapters? Without going into detail yeah. in them, because we'll go into detail yeah. individually, yeah. but what are, could you yeah. almost just list the, the chapters, chapters as you see them yeah. in your life? In, well, I did my religious training in, for, uh, from 40 to 43. In 43, in the mid, uh, middle of the war, I was asked to go to, as a companion, just because somebody had to go, and, and in those days, in the religious life, we always had to travel too until the 60s. So that was why I travelled a lot in those years, to be simply as a companion. So the first big thing was when I crossed the Atlantic 
in 43 in a convoy. To be uh, uh, just as a companion, in, to be, and I was in America until 47, because I was destined for the mission as a teacher in North Ghana, where we had started a school in the 40s, and they needed teachers. But during the war, we were not, unable to send them. So I had been sent as a companion to the States, so I was there three years, and then I went to, the, to my mission in, in Ghana. And I stayed in, in Ghana from 47 until, uh, um, let me think, um, I went to Belgium to train in catechetics in six, um, 68, 60, 68 I think. And I trained in, I was a year in um, Brussels in Louvain U University. And then they decided they needed a, a catechist in Singapore. So I went over to Singapore to help there. But I had been sent to do training for Ghana. So when I was in Singapore two, two years, but then I was called back to Ghana. So I went went back to Ghana in seventy seventy two. I'm not sure of the dates. I'll have to get the work out. And then I was back in Ghana, working in a training of catechists in Ghana until seventy seven, when my mother had a stroke, and I was asked to come back to be with her. So in 77 I came back to this country and I was with my mother and she died. And then I did a training course in counselling in London and then I went back to Ghana again in 80 and I was there till 82 when my health broke, wasn't good. So then I came back to England finally in 82. Thank you. And what have you done since coming back? Um, Eighty. When I came back, I went up to March for two years, for one eighteen months. I was sent to March. Then they wanted me to come to the Boltons in London, where we had a big house, post-war house in two houses. And I was in the Boltons for three years, and then I went to Goodmays to work for the Catholic Children's Society in Brentwood and I was in good ways until 90. Then I came, was asked to come to Brixton, Saltoon Road, and I was there for 18 months I think and then I went back to, I was asked to go back to March for two years then. From then I went to Brixton for 12 years. 12 year at Brixton. Um, I left there in 2004. 2005, I was briefly in Cold Ash for three months with a, an experimental thing that didn't work. So then I went up to Cramlington in Northumberland and I was there for Cramlington. Um, I was in Cramlington for three years. I was asked to go across to Barrow in Furness, where we had been, the sisters had been given, uh, someone had left us a house, and that house had to be looked after and looked after. So I was in Barrow for eight months, and then I went for, th uh, for three months in, I was up in, um, um, Ellen in um, north of Aberdeen for about six months and then I was sent to Coventry and I was in Coventry for three years and then from Coventry I went to Ealing for, I think I was there 18 months and from Ealing I, I went up to March and I've been there for five years. <laughs> 
you've seen a lot more of the UK than I've seen. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yes. I've had great experience here as well as in, in the other countries. Yeah. And with all this moving around, yes, you, you, always. You're, you're just, you've got so much energy. Do you yeah. think that's given you energy? Yeah. I mean, that's it's a gift to me, isn't it? It's not Amazing. Thank you yeah. so much. So, if I could ask you to return to, I suppose, your, the stage of religious training, um, up to, probably up to Ghana, so you, you were in religious training, yeah. and then in 43 you went, uh, 47 you went to Ghana. Yeah. So, this was the stage where you were really developing? Ready to be ready to go and and serve in, in yeah. Ghana as a teacher. Yeah. So what was that stage like, and and what 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 actually was the experience of of the training and the learning that you had? Of uh, well, I'd trained as a teacher before, mm -hmm. you see, and then when I went to the states, that was a wonderful trip across the Atlantic in forty three. But when I got there, um, what did I do there? I went. First of all, I would, I, yes, I did, just did secretarial work to, um, for a year. Then I was, most of the time, I went, we had um, in Roslyn in Long Island, at, when <coughs> at that time the biggest killer of children was uh, rheumatic heart disease because it wasn't recognised by doctors. And the Jewish doctor had opened this, built this complex for children, beautiful set, setting up in uh, on Long Island with different units for children with, with rheumatic heart disease. And I worked at St. Francis Sanatorium for most of the time I was in the States for three years where we had the children in different units and I looked after the different children. And so I was working with the children like that for the, until I until I the war ended and they were able to get ship and I went by ship across the Atlantic again, there. So that was a very very helpful uh, because I'd had nothing to do with sick people before, but the, these children were convalescent and uh, it was a very learning, a very interesting time, getting in touch with them and uh, the, seeing that the way they did they they responded to the treatment and I mean within I think when I returned there in the in the in the 50s it was completely out you know that was the 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 disease was recognized and there was no longer now it's a heart hospital in the, in Roslyn a big heart hospital but no longer for children so that was very really helpful for me and then from there when I went across to Ghana we were right up in the north of Ghana, where we were just starting uh, education for girls. In the Northern Territories, as it was then, before independence, it was a protectorate of Ghana, because the southern part of Ghana was rich, and so they wanted that, but nobody bothered about the top. And the, actually, the, the uh, white fathers had come across the desert into the north of Ghana, and they bought education there. And then we started a school, the first school for girls, in 1940, in the whole of northern Ghana. And uh, I got there, I was destined there, we'd only had one sister who was there who was a teacher, who had got out before the war, who was sent there in 39. And after that we weren't able to send any teachers. So I got there in, in 47, and by that time the children were had finished first primary school and we started in those days what was a middle school and then went on to secondary school and so that was when I went and then looked after the, the started the middle school there. Mm. Your earliest <coughs> memory of, of Kettering and <coughs> family life? Oh it was just a wonderful life yeah we, we lived in a Trafalgar Road which was a road that came up what was then the the gas works, and we had our best friends, the Scanlon family, who are now related to us through marriage. Their dad was a, a Yorkshire man, and he was the manager there. They had a house there, and but we had them run. We used to play there 
on the gasworks site and they had a big garden. My earliest memories of the lovely times we had, he put a, a he built a tennis court there, so when we were older it was tennis court, but before that it was exploring the gasworks and their thing and being with their family, having great times there, just at the bottom of our road, because it was not the Kettering that it is now, of course, very much changed. It was, a, uh, I think there were 30,000 in the, in the, in the, in the town as a whole, it was quite small, but now of course it's spread. But in those days it was just a little market town and very happy and everybody knew every, everyone else and it was very, really wonderful. And my earliest re recollections are just that, the, ha having this small house, which was in those days for us, but just such happy times as, as children, everything seemed I remember sulking, and I remember various things happening as a child. I remember my, hearing my mother saying to a friend, sitting down in the gasworks garden, yeah, and I remember her saying, you know, um, jo jo Josephine, as they called me then, yeah, Josephine, she's sulky child, and she's not like, she's rather sulky child. And I overheard this, and I thought, oh, she... It's not good to be sulky, child. I mustn't do that anymore. And I only remember. I remember one, the incident when I had sulked outside, and my father came and put his arm around me and said, "Come in," and I shook it off. I didn't want it. And I think it was my mother must have been referring to that. That's the only incident I remember. But I remember my when I heard overheard my mother saying, "She's a sulky child." I said, oh, well, that's not. That's not what one should, one should be. Don't, they don't like you if you do that. So I do remember that incident. I mustn't sulk. I don't think I've sulked ever since. <laughs> Your whole family, what were they all like? What were their names and what were oh, they like? Uh, oh, jo George Langley, yes. And he was from uh, uh, the... Uh, he lived in Finchley, Highgate. I think they were married in Highgate at St Joseph's. And um, he, was a, he was a civil servant. Uh, customs and excise officer. He was a very good man, very meticulous, but had a, a very good sense of humour as well. Yeah, and uh, he died of cancer, pancreatic cancer. And we all were, it, we all said what was strange about the family is we all had nicknames, and we were so friendly, and with the local parish, the local people that we all had nicknames, and my father was always called Uncle George. We had, my brother, two eldest brothers went to the Westminster Cathedral Choir School and were trained there. And they, we had a great friend, one of the priests, Father Copleston, who was a, um, from Devonshire, and he was in the clergy house, and, but he was a great friend of my eldest brother, and he used to come home. Every week he'd come up on his free day, we became a home for him. And I think that's where the, he, he couldn't call my father dad, he couldn't, so he called him Uncle George and he used to say to you, wait till your Uncle George comes home and you want, you know, and the name stuck and everyone called him Uncle George. <laughs> and my mother, who was a feisty Irish lady, always very close to the four girls. We just loved her. When we when we went out with my mother, we used to say, I bag your arm, you know, to, to hold your arm. And we used to say ahead of us, I bag mum's arm, I bag mum's arm, because we wanted to hold her arm. We were very, and she was one, and my young, um, Mags, who followed me into the convent afterwards, she was four years younger than me. She was a very creative actor. And she used to, she said, um, my mother's name was Gertrude Sullivan. My father always called her Gertz, and Mag said, Gertz is one of the girls, and she became Gertz, and everyone called her Gertz, which was unusual for children that we did, and in the parish. So my parents were known as Uncle George and Gertz, which was quite unusual. And Gerard, who was the eldest one, that when he went to to Oscar, they called him Jerry always, so he remained Jerry to the end of his life, Jerry Langley. And he was also quite an exceptional character, you didn't know him, but 
Jerry never went from A to B because he always had to carry someone in his car from <laughs> and Basil, the second boy, he was much more like my father, very meticulous and, and so on. And he just did his own thing and went his own way. But Jerry, half of the family, most of the family were very open and everyone came home. So Jerry brought everyone home. We knew all his professors from Oscar, they all came home to us. And, right, and Basil never had any friends. He was just like that. And I'm the same. Everyone came home with me. Agnes, the next girl, she was more like Basil and never had any friends to come home. Mags was the opposite. She, she had friends all the time, yes. And Titch was very open as well, the last one, and John, the last one, very open indeed. Yeah, but they had the two who were more like my father. But quiet, but very... At the same time, not not distant at all, but different characters. That was the the way the family was made up. And John coming at the end, the boy at the end, he was very special. Yeah. 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 So what did Basil? Uh, what did Basil end up doing? Basil, the <laughs> second boy, he was consumed by the love of aeroplanes from the time he was a little boy. And I remember, I think it was his. 10th or 12th birthday and what did he want? He wanted to go up in an aeroplane. Now he was born 1917, he's two years older than me and I remember my mother said that's what you want, that's what you'll have. So that was how she was and I remember there was a between uh, Kettering and um, Northampton there was an airport, Sywell, that I don't think it's developed but I think it's still there and I remember on his, whether it was 10th or 12th birthday I don't remember she took him and he went up on his aeroplane. Then he went to uh, Westminster Cathedral Choir School. He was not an academic. He hated it. He, and we still got letters from him written in hopeless handwriting and spelling. Take me out of this prison, I want to go home, and so on and so on. And he got out and he said when he left, my father said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to do aeroplanes. This was in the 30s. And so he looked into it to, um, a, what's the word I want, um, an apprenticeship, uh, to apprenticeship. And it was too expensive, he couldn't afford it. And then this, con this uh, um, work, the man who worked with him, Mr. Delacorte, he found a place in Reading, Miles. Hawker, the Miles Hawker, which was a small um, place in uh, outside Reading, yes, where, and they accepted him. Although we have a letter, it, it was written about this man, that this boy will never be any good because he's hopeless at maths and he, he knows nothing. His writing was always appalling, <laughs> almost illiterate, he couldn't get out. But he liked aeroplanes. And actually then, 1917, he was born. So what year would he have gone? He'd have left school in um, 33, wouldn't he? Yeah. He, he, he was at home for a time, but he couldn't get it. I know, I know he stayed at home for a time. And my father taught, he went for typing. and uh, yeah. because, But he said, that's the only thing I want. If I don't have that, it's the only thing I want. But eventually, before the... So he went as an apprentice to Miles Hawker, started by making, in those days they were wooden aeroplanes, and the struts inside the the air screw, hmm, they were all strutted. Those, that was his first job. And the war broke out. By that time, he had completed his apprenticeship, and of course, Miles Hawker became very important. They were uh, absorbed into some uh, firm up in um, Bas, who had already finished his apprenticeship and had some standing by that time because he was he was over twenty one, and he was had standing. The war broke out, and he was drafted up to Coventry, 
and he ended his career, he was an inspector of aircraft, on wo working on the Concorde. That was his last big thing, his job, was working on the Concorde. I don't know, um, my nephew has all the information, I said you should write your, uh, your father's life, because it's absolutely wonderful, because he was so unacademic, mm. but, but showing that when you have a love for, a calling for a, a job like that, that was his job. And actually his grandson has done just the same, just the same with um, en uh, railway engines. And his grandson is still working. He's the same type. It's, That's amazing. It's amazing. I just tell Tim, you should, he, he ought to, he ought to get the life of his, his dad. It's never been written. Mm -hmm. And he's got, because my brother was very, he's got photos, I've seen them, of well, the work that he did and all the way up. Because he was he uh, during the war he had he had to stay in Coventry he was married and he had to stay in Coventry all during the war and I don't know because I was out of the country so I don't know all the firms that he worked with but you you have really have to get in touch with Tim because mm -hmm. and he's he's got it all stored up in his attic <laughs> yeah so after Basil it was it you yeah you came after Basil and then who was after you. Then Agnes was after me. She was more in Basil's type, mm. but she was. Uh, <coughs> when the war broke out, she was at school with me. But then a, fr a friend of ours needed someone in to work in in the um, tax office, and he not wanted someone he could rely on. So she never finished her schooling. She never, she never, I don't think she ever did her sat. As far as I know, she left when she was 16 and went into this to help this man. And she ended, spent all her time in the tax office. But then when the war broke out, of course, she joined the land army because she wanted to stay. And so she did her training in the land army in Moulton and then got a job in the local convent looking after their their grounds. So she stayed at home all during the year by means like that. And so she was at home all during the year and stayed. And then she actually stayed all her life to be with my father and mother. And that was her vocation in life. And she, when my father died, 20, he, he was 72 when he died. And my mother lived on another 25 years. So she was with my mother all that time. And it was absolutely wonderful because she kept the home going. And uh, as there was one priest and two sisters, we had no home. We always had our home. So the home lasted and she spent her whole life in Kettering. And she died, well, she left Kettering to go to Nazareth House for the last 18 months of her life. But otherwise she spent her whole life in Kettering looking after other people. She was a wonderful person. She cared all her life for other people. That's yeah. really wonderful. Mm. After Agnes... Came uh, Margaret. She followed in my footsteps, exactly. She well, left uh, school. She did um, a year's teaching, which coincided with the first years of the war the first year of the war and taught in Birmingham during the first year of the war. Then she went to college and the college I was at, which was originally here in London in St. Charles, in 19, when I finished college, 39, it was the outbreak of war and they had to be evacuated. And that college, we had our big novitiate, which was built in Kodash down near Newbury, Thatcham, there. And they built this big new um, um, wing for novices because there were a lot of young people joining there. So they asked the Sacred Heart College, which is now Roehampton Institute, it was, this was part of it, they asked to be evacuated there. 
So they were evacuated to the our place down in Coldash, which is a big place, and they were eva the college was evacuated there. So when I entered, I had left the college one year, taught for one year, went then to the novitiate, but the college was already also on that same campus. So you were with her? <coughs> and she, ent she went to do her teacher training, mm. mags. Mm. I was in the novitiate to do my training, and she was in the college, <laughs> yes, all the time. She did the same as me. She finished college, and then she went and taught for a year, and then she entered the novitiate, went back to the novitiate to, to go on a missionary life. But that was post-war, mm. and we had a school in Canning Town, which had been bombed, and unfortunately for Mags, her whole life as a missionary was spent teaching in England, in downtown. So she started off in Canning Town, where we were just rebuilding because the whole site had been bombed there. And she taught there. And then we had opened a school in uh, Liverpool. We went to, the, we were asked to go to help at the cathedral, but the, she went up there and downtown Liverpool, and she loved that. And she taught there. Uh, at the Cold Ash, coming back to Cold Ash, that has a history of its own. That original house was belonged to a lady, Alice Fitzwilliam, who was a Irish lady, and her husband died. This is back in the 1920s. I think, and she bequeathed that house, which is on the ridge in, in Coldash, a very beautiful site, to the, gave it to our sisters for the use of children, to be used for needy children. And actually, her husband died, Lady Alice Fitzwilliam gave that. We moved in and, and put an extension on and immediately started with orphans that came to us and then during the war of course that e extended. She, Lady Alice Fitzwilliam lived, went and lived in a farm at the bottom of the hill there, the site is very beautiful and then when she was ill she came back and we nursed her till she died and she's buried in the cemetery there. Meanwhile the school had developed and especially during the war years and the a saga of its own how the Americans helped us there with that school, that's a saga of its own. And, um, but then that school developed so much as Coldash developed, which is a very upper class region and school going. And they want, it was a private school, uh, originally just an orphanage. But so then they wanted to make it into a, 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 a state school run by the church, a Catholic. Catholic primary school. So they needed a head teacher for this to change it because anyone could be, various people in the private group would be teaching there. So then Max was asked to come down from Liverpool where she had been head there and to start turning this into a, 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 a Catholic primary school, which is still going at this moment. Uh, she did that for a few years. But then Berkshire were offering early retirement. So she, <laughs> she jumped on the bandwagon and asked, for, uh, could she retire? She was spent all her life there. So she did. She got early retirement and she went on a sabbatical. And then she was posted to Malta, to our house. Our, we have our houses in Malta. And she was there just one year. And that coincided with my leaving March. And they needed a, a catechist. She was a okay, trained catechist as well. They, need, they needed a, a catechist in March because I was asked to come to the Boltons. So she only had one year in Malta. Then she came to March and she was there. And she worked there. And then we opened a mission uh, a house in Peterborough. In the, in the new uh, development of Peterborough, in the Autumns. And she worked in the Autumns there. She was there. 
Then she went up to Cramlington and she worked there. And then she, from Cramlington, she came down to London and she worked in, she was a bit like me then, she worked in various houses. She was in our house in Putney and Wimbledon. And then in Wimbledon, then that was when she, she got cancer in 2010 and she died in 2011, yeah. And she asked when the, the provincial said, where do you want, she came up to March and spent the last few months there and then went to Canning Town to die. She wanted to go back to Canning Town to the East End and she's buried there in Canning Town, yeah. Why did she want to go back to Canning Town? Is that the family no, roots? Well, or? it was because it was. she loved it. In the beginning, she had taught there when she came up, finished the novitiate, and yeah. that's where she began her teaching career. And we also have a care home. The, it was bombed during the war. We were built, it was being redone. And then we finally put it as a care home for our elderly sisters. And so she knew she was dying So when she had the cancer. And... Uh, so she said she'd like to go there to, and die and be buried in Canning Town, where she'd started her life. So, so what, one of you ended up teaching. <laughs> yes. yes. All the teaching that you didn't do got so, done yeah. by her, no. and more. She was yes, head she, teacher. Yes, yeah, oh, yes. She was head. She she didn't like being head. She was she was head in, in Liverpool, and then she stepped down and said, "Mrs. Mack, Mrs. Mack was a wonderful person." So she said to Mrs. Mack, "You." So she, be, Mrs. Mack became head, and she became deputy head, <laughs> and then she moved down to. I've Cornwall. never heard of that happening. Yeah, before. no, that happened in Liverpool. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's. <laughs> and then the last one, Mary. Mary has a, a wonderful life because she was the last one. She was very small. They, they were very small, anyways. M Mary was very small, but when she was um, five years old, in the March. It was a very bad year. She got uh, had scarlet fever. In those days, we would have to go to hospital when she was scarlet fever. And in the September, she came out from scarlet fever. She got diphtheria, very bad. And she was only a little child, you see. So she went back to the isolation hospital and it had affected her heart. She had a heart murmur. And she was in the hospital from the September to the December and they because of the heart problem, I remember seeing her, she looked absolutely, they thought she was going to die. And um, they had to send her home because there was no one else in the hospital. They couldn't leave the hospital a, a, a lot for her. And she was actually in bed for, for the following six months. And I remember Dr. Lee used to come every day to see her because he said he'd never th th think she would see her alive. And I remember her as a little child in the bed. Her lips were absolutely blue. But she has a spirit. Her tit, she, uh, anyway, um, she lived because she'd been those sick. And we were told by the doctor, he said, you mustn't cross her in any way because if she gets excited and goes into a tantrum, it would be fatal. So you have to give her everything that she demands. <laughs> But she was always this little one in the bed. We were watching her all the time. But well, she survived. And there was no holding her back. So she had actually done two weeks in school, and then she got sick, and then she was in bed for the following year. So then after that, she went to a private school and in, in, in Kettering until the nuns came to Kettering. The Ursula nuns came from Germany during, before the war in the 1930s and started a schooling, a Catholic school in Kettering, primary school, it was a private school. So then she went there for her training uh, uh, and then she went to Northampton. No, oh no, she was in Northampton before that, just for a couple of weeks or so. Then she was brought up by the nuns in Kettering. So she didn't have to travel for her education, but she was there. And uh, from there, when she, uh, she, she had a, just a spirit of, of, and she wasn't supposed to do any PE or anything like that, but she used to do it just the same because, but she remained always very small. And um, then, um, so she finished, she was with the Ursulines, and then she went to college. So 
so let me see, she was born in 26, 18, she, that would have been 44, wouldn't it? She'd have gone to college. So she went to Coldash, the last year of the war, yes. So she then went down to Coldash. But in the meantime, she'd been at home, and we had all these American priests who were, and they had many bases around us, very big bases, and the priests used to come and have a, a easy time. They'd just come and sit in our house and chat and so on. And of course, Father Poletti, who was a passionist priest, a, a, a American chaplain, he had uh, his batman was a man called George Lehman, and George came from um, Cleveland in Ohio, and Father Poletti never treated him anyhow else as a buddy. And George had entered, he had very bad eyesight, so he couldn't do anything, so that he was Batman. And he was a very good driver and very musical. Player. And so George never sat outside in the car, when in the Jeep. He was in the house. So then he fell in love with, with Titch. Um, when Titch was in school, when Mary was in school, she was so small, she, they gave her the name of Titch. So she was always called Titch. Mags, by the way, became Mags. Margaret never got Mags, but, but Titch. So for all her life, she was Titch for us. But George, he always called her Mary. So anyhow, he proposed to her. And she said to her mother, do you think? <laughs> she said, well, if you love her, if you love him, okay. But she only had, by that time, she'd only done one year in the training college. And then he wanted to marry her because it was the end of the war, 45, and he, if he didn't, he couldn't get her back. So they decided. So she, she got married to George, and I think she was just 20. And later on in her life, she said, you know, <laughs> she said, I should never have done that, you know, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> and so she found herself then on the Queen Mary going across, and that would have been by this time, I was in Roslyn in Long Island, so George, when he, there's another old saga about George, of course, um, he had visited me when he came over. He'd seen me, I'd seen him in Coldash because Father Paletti had come down to see me before I left for the States in 43. So that was a saga of its own. I met up with him then. And, uh, but then they married, would be, would be 45, I suppose, well, 44, I guess, and then he went back, yes, then 45, she came over to the States. So I was already in the States, and George had already visited me in the States when he came, and then when she arrived, then they both came to see me in Roslyn, that, uh, before they settled down in Cleveland. And then she had, and he had very little then, they were very, because they had, he was nothing. He was a, no job, just back working. And then he went into work in a, some sort of factory. And yes, oh, what was the name of the, I've forgotten now. They made tools, I don't know the name, the very famous place for making tools. Anyway, that's his job. And he had, to, he lived in his dad's house, his mother was dead. And she had no house at the beginning. They lived in his house, then they got their own house. And she used to say afterwards, you know, it was so lovely because we appreciated so much every bit of furniture that we were able to buy as we bought it because we had nothing to start with. And it was just wonderful. The, the people nowadays, they don't appreciate the furniture, but we did every little bit that we got. And she had eight children, eventually, yeah, who was the one that was supposed to die, a tiny little tit. She was called tit always, and she was so tiny. And she had, she just had a wonderful family there. And the two of them brought them up wonderfully, four boys and four girls, yeah. And they're still very wonderful. And she had ended her days in 2011, 2010, 2010. She came over here for her, and we had, a, that was where your grandma was thing. We 
had a, 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 a holiday house at Little Hampton, down at Little Hampton, and we had it all in the March that year. And we went there, uh, Titch was coming over, so we said, we're not going to travel, we're going to stay there, and anyone who wants to come and see us, we're there. So Titch just came into London, and we drove her down, straight down to Little Hampton, and she was there the month, I think. And all the people who wanted, we had met many people there. It was so wonderful, and your grandma came, and it was wonderful. And um, her, Titch's birthday was the 31st of March, so on the 30th, she, we came up on the 29th, she spent the night in, here in Ealing with us and then we drove her to the airport on the 30th so that she'd be back for her b birthday to celebrate with them. So that happened in March 2010. In June that year I got a, an e um, uh, email from Titch to say that she had had uh, seen the doctor because she was unwell. She had pancreatic cancer and would die within three months. We knew this. My father had died like that, which was exactly what happened to her. And she was so happy because she had three months at home. And she said to the doctor when he told her, he said, when I die, when I, I want to go stay at home as long as I can, when I'm when I'm no longer able to look after myself, I want to go into the hospice here, near where she lived, in my, uh, in um, the part of Cleveland she lived, and which is what exactly happened. And all the family, all the grandchildren, they all went to see her during those three months and said goodbye to her, knowing that she was going to die. Yeah. And she, and then in the August, mid August, she. She got, she was, by that time she was in a wheelchair. She attended the, the baptism of a, a great grandson. And twins, I think they were twins. Yep, yeah, the twins were born. And she got lovely pictures of that. And then on the last, on a, this final um, Saturday, she said, this is it, I've got to move. And they took her to the hospice and she died on the following Tuesday morning, early. But she was happy to have finished that happy. way. Yeah, That's and amazing. it was lovely because she said all the children were there on the, they, they were all round her and they knew that she was there and she'd settled everything mm. because her eldest son was schizophrenic, Chris, he's died since, and he, he was at the home, he'd lived at home. He was, he was a very, it was under control, mm -hmm. and he was a very good man, able, and he'd looked after his mum for the past, uh, since her husband died, two years before he died before, and Chris had been looked after. It was just wonderful, and so she was able to leave and make it a sleep that Chris would be looked after, and, and they were happy to see her go like that. Mm. Yeah, that's just life and death. Yes, that's and, it. And it was a nice yeah, way to yeah, end it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sounds like she had a, a totally different life. Totally different, yeah. But, but incredible. And there was a boy at the end. Then John. John came at the end, like three years after Titch, yes. He was the last one. I want to hear about John before we have lunch. After lunch? Before we, before before we lunch. have lunch. Oh, no, that OK, be that's fine. John, well, he was just wonderful. He was my little brother. So How much younger was he? But I, he was born 29, so he was uh, 10 years younger than me, yeah, yeah. Similar to me and my little yeah, sister. Yeah, yeah, And he was just so lovely before, so for me, well for all of us John was very special, and for, because, and also he married late because of the circumstances and so on, and, uh, but then he's passed on in his family very much the same as our, well, Titch's family too, there. But they're different because they're American, brought up, and they so there's, and there's more spread out. But uh, John's family have really, really carried on sort of the, the tradition, and because um, on Rosemary's side he married the the, the, the lady he married is is Irish and very very um, creative and you know the way the Irish are. So that 
they've got it on both sides because John was very musical. Cat, he was very musical and very creative. Fair boy, and just so special. So he went to, uh, I, and I was very close to him because after I left um, school, I did two years, and my father, before I went to the college, my father, I was, th he thought, I didn't know what I wanted to do. My father thought we'd go to the civil service like him. And I spent two years studying at home to go to the civil service. But I, when I, I got there, I, 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 I turned the job down because I was going to the convent, so I never got to the civil service. But, so I was, those years I was at home, John was in the private school in Ketchers there, in the, and so I was very close to him all that time. And my mother knew that he was very musical, so when he was a little boy, she wanted to uh, have piano lessons for him, but money wasn't it, wasn't that bad. So she, my mother was very, un, uh, very crafty, so she, as my father's birthday present, she would give him, John would play a thing. So she played, she sent this John to go to piano lessons when he was five and six. But his dad didn't know anything about it. And so, and my father was always very, he came back from the office at half past four and he, um, if you weren't back from school, where were you, you know? So John um, used to go for his music lesson and he would go, that was all right when he, my father wasn't there. Then he'd come back and my father was back. So he'd come in the house, but he put the music the books under the mat <laughs> on the front door. So he came in through the back door and my father would see him coming. You're a bit late from school. Yes, he said, we were, you know, we were played afterwards and so on. And then he'd have to go to the front door and he'd say, I opened the front door and let my music books in and close them. He had to keep it quiet. So it, that was, so then when our father's birthday came, he went in and that was it and John was playing the piano. So it was okay after that, he went on and he was. And then he, <coughs> so he went through the school then and then when the war broke out, and when he was 11, um, he went, he didn't go to the Westminster Quiet Quiet School, he went to, we had the Dominicans who had a private school at Laxton between Kettering and Stamford. So he was brought up by the Dominicans there. And so the result was <coughs> that during the war, he was close at home, and he used to come home on a bicycle when he got the chance. And, and the Dominicans would come home more priests in the house, a lot more fun and games in the house. And um, so he was at home, as it were, but in school all his, and then from there, um, well then, uh, you see, I think after that I, I lost it, I was out, but I think he, what age would he, he have had to do his, um, uh, they ha he had to do his military ser the service whenever he left school, I suppose. When he finished his... Uh, 18 or so? Yeah, yeah. He, he would have gone. So but he, did he hated it. He d went into the Air Force. He loathed it. It wasn't his style at all. But so he had to do that. I was away. Then he went to Strawberry Hill, trained as a teacher, but he also did his got his LRAM. But he was at Strawberry Hill. He did his training there. And then he met... Um, he was, um, he must have got a job here in London because he, oh no, I know, he was um, playing the organ in um, the um, Pimlico, in the, the, the um, what's the name of the church there? Um, I've forgotten the name, it, we, uh, Claverton Street. That, the Claverton Street, there was a church, Catholic church there with a, and actually our sisters lived there and we were bombed during the war and we left it. But there, that was the church, and he played the organ there. That that was very important for him. And in the choir was this young, nice young lady, Rosemary. <laughs> and they fell in love. He, she was, I think she's ten years younger than him. But anyway, they got married finally. But by this time, he was quite a bit older because he'd trained, done his military service, done his taught, and he was teaching here in London with her. And so they got married in 19, 
60. They got married. My father died in, in 59 and he got married in 60. So he was quite late compared with the others, with the rest, the other yeah. family. But so then he got married and um, by this time he taught here for, they taught here for a bit and by this time Gerard, the eldest brother, he was in Swatham. He was the parish priest in Swatham and they they had a private school there run by the nuns there and they wanted to take boys. They were asked to take boys and boarders. And they couldn't take them there because they had no accommodation for boarders. And Jerry asked John to go up and help teach in the school in Swatham. So they left London and they went to Swatham. And the first three children were born while they were in Swatham. Thank you. Unbelievable life. Do you want me to go on with John? Or Th that's fine. And maybe just share... Is, he, is John still alive? But no. 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 So maybe just share... Um, quickly, they moved from then, Swatham yeah. um, to Bedford then, to El Elstow, Bedford. And the, the um, Maggie Down were, were, were born in Bedford. So the first four children were born in Swatham. But then they came to Bedford to Elstow, this lovely house there, and they stayed there and uh, they moved it there. When the children all left, they had a beautiful house there, and they moved to a, uh, further into Bedford, and they're actually in Bedford now. The house is Brackley Road in, in Bedford by the time the, the other children had left. And he, he, st he lived there and he, carried, he did everything. He taught, he taught. He could never teach music because he he was too musical. He couldn't stand the children like that. But he, but he was musical and he played in the organ, or played the organ and so on all his life. But he gave up teaching. He did, being John, he did everything. He took on a, a corner shop in Elstow yeah. that worked for some time. He changed that. He used to deliver newspapers in the morning and he used to deliver, deliver the Catholic papers. He did everything his hand and everything and um, then why did he why did he do so many things did he just like trying things well out? he couldn't stand teaching because uh, he uh, th th they went into t uh, he was science teacher as well strangely enough <coughs> and he just lost patience with the with the with the children it wasn't his start he, he wasn't a teacher and so he just did everything they kept sheep in order because he didn't want to mow the lawn, so they kept sheep. <laughs> uh, one sheep to, to mow the lawn, and then they ate it at the following Easter. <laughs> he, he was just out of this world, yeah. He did everything. But when he died, he had a stroke, unfortunately. The youngest boy, Ben, never knew his dad as a well man. He had a stroke, one, which quite affected him. And then he. He died. He was seven. He died in uh, two thousand. He had an exceptional death as well. Of course, he had to. <laughs> His death. Rosemary was in the hospital with varicose veins, and she was so glad because she was going to get a rest and some attention. So he went in to see her after the after the, and he was having difficulty walking. <coughs> And when he, <coughs> it was just after the operation, and he went to see, and one of his daughters was with him, and he couldn't walk. He he was in the hospital itself, and he he had had a bit of difficulty. But suddenly, take he just couldn't. So Katie was with him. She called the got a wheelchair, called the and took him to the A and E department, and he landed up in the intensive care up, and. That was, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, I think it was February or February time. February, I think. So Rosemary was down, expecting a lot of attention, because and got none because John was dangerously ill. And then they had to get I don't know how many doctors because it was the aortic nerve at the back here, which had caused that, and they had to have an operation. So he, I think he was operated. I haven't got the exact dates, but I think he was operated. In the March, they had to wait for get three consultants or something. It took some time, time. 
And then I saw him last. He, the operation was a success, and he was back home. He died on the 18th. It was April, was it? I don't, I don't, I've got my dates so mixed up. Anyway, I can confirm those later. I went to see him. Max and I went to see him, and it was on a Friday. And he was out of hospital, and he was fine, and he was playing. So we uh, uh, listened to some of his nice music. And I walked down the block with him to post a letter, and he was fine. And the following, yes, the following Wednesday, I think, was uh, was uh, the 19th of April. And I was going to, well, I was going to the prison in Wandsworth, and I got a phone call from Rosemary to say he died. She found him dead in his bed. As quick as that, and it was the the medics were very disappointed because the the operation had been the success, mm. but it was a blood clot. So he died like that, just as suddenly as that, which was lovely for him, but very hard for Rosemary. Mm. 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 Imagine. Yeah. Yeah. But an extraordinary character through his yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, he was quite out of this world altogether, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry. <laughs> we have come to know each other through my grandma. Yeah. And how did that meeting happen? And how, when did you meet her? And, yeah. um, and how did that story evolve? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you, you, for, my grandmother knows the, the background of how she came to Kettering. Mm -hmm. So I only know from, from Kettering that when I was there, it was just the last few months, because she'd been in a, a different billet in Kettering, that she came to our house. And I don't know the exact date, you'd have to get it from your grandma. <coughs> but she was certainly there in 1940 when I left, the year that I left. I left in the September and in the March, April, no, March, April, Jerry had been ordained and March, Baz was married, that's right. Now, I don't know if she was there for that, that time, but she certainly came that year and she was in the house when I left. So I really didn't know her well. It was my sisters who knew her well. So I knew her and uh, also her brother, yeah. She, he was he he came, he was in our house as well. I remember him. But then I was Is that Peter or Gary? Gary, Gary, yeah, Gary, the little one who was there. And uh, so those are, I have those memories of her. But then afterwards, she was just a, a name to me because once we entered the convent in those days, it was forever and we never thought we'd come home again as a missionary, you see. Well, I went on my way, and I did come home several times um, to bring other people and for other reasons. But uh, then, so I really didn't get in touch with her again as a person until I came back to, to England those three years that I was here at the end of the se uh, 77 to 80 to, with my mother. Then I met up with her, and then I met your granddad, and that was how I came back. Because she, in the meantime, of course, she was very much part of the family. Because my, especially Ag Aga, the, the one that stayed at home in Kettering, where she had a home in Kettering, until, well, that was what she knew, and, and your dad and so on used to come up visiting Kettering, make it quite a bit, especially when the children were young for Wickseeds Park and so on. So they, they were in constant communication, but it was not me that was, it was I, and especially Titch from the States that they corresponded by writing. But for my, then I didn't really meet up with your, your, your mum too much, except I visited her when, 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 her, uh, when her husband with Peter mm -hmm. was still there, and then I went several times to around Garden City to see her, yeah. Thank you. Um, I suppose the next question, you, you said earlier that you had this vocation to be a missionary. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily something you wanted, but it was something that you, God, I, I, you I knew you I felt the call that was do. what I, yeah. Could you describe 
when that happened and and how did it feel and mm. how did you go through that? Uh, I was in college at the time and um, I felt that I'd been brought up with Notre Dame nuns and then I was with the College of the Sacred Heart nuns, both educationalists and I was going into education and I just felt that I was called but I didn't know why but I sort of didn't want to go along that path myself that's how I felt I said I used to say more prayers say no I don't want this <laughs> but then uh, one day when I really felt the call we had various different sisters students as well and I knew them friends with them and so on but there was two there were some that came in every day from different places in London and I only knew that these two that came they they had a white habit but they had a black of grey cloak and a black veil and they used to come in every day I didn't know why but I was cleaning that part of the thing and they used to go straight to the chapel every day and then they went, I didn't know who they were. Then I, I landed up in the geography class with one of them and um, I didn't, I just knew her, who she was and talked to her because we were going out on field trips and we talked about that so I just knew who she was and her name. And uh, then one day in the cha I was kneeling in the chapel and these two walked in to, to make the way they usually did and sat down, down and, and I just felt, who are they? That's where you belong. But I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know their name, the name of the congregation or anything. And I just, it, for the call I say, you know, you just know, and I think it's the same with married people. I've uh, talked a lot to married people and sometimes, as this man said, he went into this pub where they were dancing with the thing, and he looked across the room and he said, that's the girl I'm going to marry. Stella, her name was. And he asked someone to introduce them. and he had no idea who she was. But it was a call. He's deeply in love with her. She's dead now, but he's still deeply in love with her. And, I often, and I've heard other stories from people like that, hmm? that this is the one I'm going to marry, even though they have no... Well, it's a call is like that. It's the first, it comes from God. This is what you're called to do. So well, I went out of the chapel and I went to the um, the, 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 the one who was the um, superior, whatever, the, the president there of the college. And I just said to her, who are these nuns? I don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. She said, oh, they're Francis Commission and Mary. I didn't know at that time that, that co their congregation were in, in touch with ours because they were going to be evacuated to our place. I didn't know any of that. But this nun who knew me, very, very wonderful nun, she, she knew me as a person and one of the students. And um, she just said, uh, oh yes, yeah, she said, I think, uh, I think that would be a good place for you to be. And she said, I'll, let, I'll make an appointment and they were nuns, they lived in Claverton Street here in, in Victoria and uh, she made the appointment and that, uh, and I went to see them and I thought, well, the missionary, I'd never thought of the missions, I hadn't been attracted in any way, but it was simply that call that this was what I was wanted to do. So I saw them there and then I left college and the, the principal said to me the best thing you don't go right away from college, teach for a year and make sure, you see, which is what I did, went out, and then during that year, 1939 to 40, while I was teaching, I was, then I told my parents, and they all said to, everyone said to me, so all the people knew, why are you going there? I said, I haven't the slightest idea, because I, why didn't you go to an order that you know? I said, I don't know, but this is the one I'm going to, because I don't know, but this is the one I'm forward to. And it was just like that. And I entered with them. And I found it very difficult at the beginning. I thought, I thought especially the way we lived in those days, I said, we're all completely 
man to behave like this. But if this is what you want of me, okay. And I just said, you know, when I get to the missions, it will be different and so on. And, uh, but I fought it quite a bit uh, at the beginning, but I knew that, was, although I didn't want it, I knew that's where I belonged. And I don't know if any other people following a call know that this is what I've got to do, even though I'm not really happy doing it. But once I got on the way, and I never looked back afterwards, it was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and you said how you lived in those days. So what, what well, were those initial It was very regimented. Everything was regimented, and it worked by the rule like this. And, I mean, for now, the theology that, I don't know if you were brought up on them, but we were brought up, it's absolutely abominable. <laughs> absolutely abominable. <laughs> we were all taught, uh, if you don't go to Mass, you go to Hell, and, that, and what sort of person would like a God that's going to send you to Hell? <laughs> it's not the right God, but we were brought up like that. And I understand why many of the young ones don't want anything to do with that, neither would I. I don't want anything to do with a God like that, that's not the God. And unless you unless you take the time to see that it was a very bad theology. But as in everything in life, if you look back into history, you'll see the reasons why it was like this. If you don't have a sense of history, you won't. We'll never understand how life evolves and help it change if we look at history. And that's, for me, and that's the problem with our world. We do not learn from... And yet our way, main, main way of learning it with the the um, French Enlightenment, when everything went up here, but that's only a small part of the body. The main part is down here, with the the gut and the affections, mm -hmm. and that's been the big difficulty in the whole of life. And of course, it's hit religion as well. So, and uh, some. I've heard it explained, you know, very often, it's simply, well, some part of a simple explanation, but the easiest way, people, we always want power, that's all of us, it's in the beginning of the Gospel, we wanted power, you know, to be, we all want to be God, we all want to do our own thing, which is naturally, it's in us, but it's also, can be, you can go too far like anything out of thing, and you go wrong, but if we, <coughs> Any institution, whatever it is, be it church, civil, whatever, the easiest way to govern them is by rules and regulations. So that's what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not the best way. Yeah. And we're still looking, I think, politically for the best way. We haven't yeah. found it yet as human beings. Because that's not the best way. But that's the easiest way to keep people in control. Yeah. So the church went along. Empires, the church became an empire. because. But now the empires are all decisive, and we're left with our ass because we don't know what to do. Because the easiest way is to keep people in control yeah. that way. And now we, you people have to find a better way. Yeah. Because so far, human beings haven't found a better way. If you have a benign ruler, you're okay, but you don't often get a benign ruler. So you get authoritative and so on. I can see it in history like that. And so you can see, if you learn by history, we look back and say, what have people learned? What can we learn from what the past? Because the, the only, really the best way of learning is by experience, studying your experience. Mm -hmm. You put that off, haven't you? Yeah. No, no. So. It just it switched uh, off for a minute. No, oh, I see. No, it's only because a, a book was written recently by a, a, a Jesuit who died, and he's it's all on this this question. He died. died. What, what, what is it called? Um, give me time. I'll, mm. I'll tell you afterwards. Okay, I'll just I'll note down. Yeah. For later. It, Jerry Hughes. Um, what is it called? I'm hopeless on titles. Yeah. I know the book, but it will come. I'll ask you later. Oh, yeah. Jerry Hughes. Jerry Hughes. So, back to the time of, of mm. I suppose, you, you, you took that vocation, and yeah. what, 
what were the biggest influences on your early life, either people or or ideas, books? What what would the, you... the biggest influences? Influences. Well, I I think probably I thought what formed me is the um, a lot of the uh, the beginnings of our institute and how the. That the missionary went out ready for anything, and I think that we ready for anything. So I was ready to go when I was going. I went, and I always say that. And also, the 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 congregation to which I belong, um, it's such a lovely family spirit. Wherever I am in the world, I walk into an FM home, and I'm at home. And I, that's where I belong, because, and the acceptation of all sorts of characters. Uh, that uh, we come together, and but we we one we're one family, and the and also the um, internationality I think very very important because some people say that, you know it's so hard uh, living with different cultures and all this nonsense. Coming back to England, living with with all English people is no is just as difficult and more so than living with Indian and African sisters. Yeah? We're all human beings, and <laughs> say. Culture, no. I had no problem with culture shock until I came back to my own country after being out 40 years or so from living. Come back to England 40 years afterwards, then I got a culture shock. But I had no culture shock when I went into the middle of Africa and had no water and no electricity and so on. In the primitive life, it was fine. Yeah. And what was that culture shock coming back? What was the change in England and the materiality of the people here compared with the people I was living with? Yeah, out there, and I was used to. Yeah, and the the phoniness of here, you know, you sit down even now with people and talk, and it's all small talk. You know, we waste our time with talking about this, that, and the other. But look at the television, what the news that you spend and people are out looking at. It's like we've got we've got all this material, yeah, and so we've almost shut off, yeah, caring about yeah. anything that's worth. But that's what we what were saying earlier. Coming back to yeah. art, uh, people now we we go going to things that are worth looking at and the meaning of life, as you're talking about. Mm. But for the most part, you can't talk about this with ordinary people. They have no clue what you're talking about. Hmm. Mm. And I think very often also when we're blessed as you are with a good family background, when you've got a loving family and you've had security, that nothing replaces that. You can pick people out and anywhere. They've suffered from their childhood. They haven't had that security as childhood that we have and the love, which is evident with you immediately with your family. And, and it's a blessing. Yeah. No, and so few kids have it nowadays, and that's a s tragic in our society. Mm -hmm. I'd like, I'd love to hear the story of you going to America, mm -hmm. and being on a boat yeah. in the middle of the war mm -hmm. in 1943. 43, yeah. Could you just recount that, and maybe just with a little introduction of why you know why you were going and mm. just what i said at that last yeah. time yeah. well i finished my training and, and i just made my first vows and uh, we had a sister it was the big, uh, the americans had come over and we had brought with them the information about their um, medical advances and so on and remember our sisters are international and our general late is in Rome, but when the war broke out, they, the general who was in Rome sent the delegate general. She stayed in Rome, but she had to have someone out of the war zone. So she went to Portugal at the beginning. This her name was Mother Saint Agnes. Her was her religious name. And then, when things got hotter in here, she went over to New York because from New York. She was able to correspond with the rest of the world, whereas Rome couldn't, and so on. So our generator, as it were, during the war, was then in New York. So 
because of our sisters there and our connections all over, when in England this superior had had um, cancer and we heard that there was, they had a, they could cure it in America, they wanted to send her over and it must have been with the help of the American chaplains and so on. I don't know, but some influence is that in 43, which was the worst, worst year in the war for boats being sunk in the Atlantic, and that was where the Germans were centering their forces, um, that we were sending convoys over from this country and all the, na the um, merchant navy ships had been commissioned by the, by the government, they were all taken for that. And evidently that was the, but I, I didn't know all about that, except that I was said, she, mother, uh, the, this sister, mother bride, was being sent over to, to New York because of her cancer, and she could have treatment for it. And she had to have a companion, and so I was just, she told me, she said, well, I just came out and saw you walking on the corridor, she said, you've just finished, she'll do, she'll go. So they had to get passport and so on for me, and all I knew was that I was going to Rome, uh, to uh, New York. And I was a young person then, I was, and I hadn't heard much about war because I, I was in the convent and in those days we didn't hear anything, we were in strict training. So anyway, I landed up and I was told that I was going on to the States. So in those days they packed your things for you and I was told that on this day we went to Reading Station but no, no, there were no notices up so we didn't know where we were but we recognised Reading Station but then where we went to we didn't know but the sister who was with me had travelled a bit, a bit she was Irish and she knew or she said I think we're going over west and evidently we were but it was all silent we were told not to speak to anyone and the papers were given to the, the, the to mother bride she had those and we were told that we were followed all the way we were told when to get off and the gentleman would come and ask who we were and then and then so all i know is we got off of the train eventually somewhere and then we were led to, somewhere to, to hang us on the port side of us have been because by that evening we left at about eight o'clock in the morning by that evening we were on the boat we were on the ship there but as I said I'm not sure where and I think we started off the next day but we found ourselves on the ship which we there were other passengers I think there were about ten of us all together but we weren't supposed to speak to anyone and when we went to the dining room, it was, as I say, it was just, I, afterwards I learned that it was a banana boat, so it was a merchant navy. And when we went to the dining room, there was the captain at the top, and then the first mate and the first engineer, and then Mother Bride and myself, and then the others, so, but we didn't talk with them. So that was how it landed up. And we did get a bit of information, not, not immediately, but as the time went on. So we, then we were shown, we had one cabin, two bunks like that and there was a toilet attached to it in the bathroom very small just that's all that's all and so we started off and then we sailed slowly and then we went but we didn't know where we were going but actually I, we learned afterwards that we went up the Irish Sea and gradually collected other b ships from other ports and then we must have turned out to oh then because I explained about the uh, we had to be covered by aircraft and they could only do a certain amount so they circled we, we used to come over us every day and but only so far we had to have three aircraft carriers to cover the central part of the atlantic before the americans took over but it, we had to it seems we zigzagged across the uh, atlantic and as i say it took three year, three weeks to to do the journey and as from the second or third night out, we were told we couldn't undress at all because we, were, we had life jackets on all the time, day and night. So we were washed and then dressed again. And uh, that lasted for the whole journey until we got to New York. And I know we went very 
north because it got very, very cold and on our way over. I had um, one um, Russian princess was there and she was telling me about communism. The one thing I remember that she told me, and because she was horrified, she said, you know that marriage now, when they get married in communism, they go in to get married to them, and they so it's all just a, um, a, a legal thing well how long for how long how many years and you said how many years did you want to get married for and it was signed on the document that was what she told me <laughs> and uh, my mother told me afterwards that i had said which i didn't know that there was a famous film actress on the, but I wouldn't have known a famous film actress. But she says, yes, it was. I don't even remember the name of the film actress that went across. But obviously, going for. So we were very fortunate to get a. a, a because it was very dangerous. And more than 50% boats went down during that time. But the greater uh, excitement was to arrive in New York on the Sunday afternoon and see the lights of New York as <laughs> going. And the the, um, the delegate general came down, and the first thing she said, "Look at the lights! Look at the lights!" <laughs> yeah, because it was so beautiful. Yes. So that was my, uh, the trip across. That's amazing! Wow. Mm, it was great. It was a great experience, and I loved it. I loved it, and especially on the deck. Or the, and I met or on the deck at night. I loved it, especially with the moon. I've always loved sailing since then. It's the best way of travelling. Uh, but then, then I met the, um, um, the the Maltese man who told me that the, in the steerage that we didn't know anything about that there were um, a, a ten or a dozen men there who had been cut mostly Maltese working on the shipyards here and they were going across being shipped across to the West Indies where we were building the ships there and they were taken across too on the same boat. On, they were the, in the steerage. We didn't even see them. I met this man. He was three up, weeks. Yeah. For three weeks on the same boat, and you didn't even. You know, I only saw him the, the, a couple of nights. We met because I, I was. A, I used to walk around the, the boat at night because I loved it out there with the with the moon, and uh, he came and stood beside me, and we were talking, and then he took, gave me this information. So he said, "Oh, we're downstairs more. Probably he wasn't supposed to be up there. I should imagine, but he was." And he, he was a Catholic, and we was, I was talking to him. I gave him my rosary, He's, because he was like that. So I remember giving him my rosary. And another dubious thing that happened on that thing is I was up there one night, and the captain came and said, would I like to go up to the bridge? And of course I would. <laughs> so I went up to the bridge with him, and he gave me a drink. <laughs> that was the only time I ever saw my companion annoyed and she was annoyed <laughs> when I went down because she probably smelled that I said drink as well <laughs> yeah that's hilarious yeah that was the, the funny part of it <laughs> she told me afterwards incidentally she told me afterwards years afterwards I met her when I went back to the states <laughs> when she went, she said you know she said when when you, you were young and fresh and red, you know, and, and when you only saw the face anyhow, you didn't see anywhere else, anything else. And she said, you know, when you left Cold Dash and you were so young, and, and the sister said, you know, she's taking a young person like that over the state, she'll lose her vocation <laughs> there. And Mother Bride said to me, she said, she said, I didn't think you'd use a vocation in, in the States, but I think I, I did think you'd lose it on your way over. <laughs> All, all those mariners, all, all those seamen, yes. dangerous men. Yeah. Yeah. How do you? St <laughs> I was asking how do you steer the ship and all this sort of thing. I want to know what was going on. <laughs> oh. I really want to hear about Ghana, and oh, that's a long story. <laughs> yeah, just um, why you were going and the first impressions getting mm. there mm. and what happened yeah mm. well the that part of ghana the north 
the history of it is the White Fathers had come across the the desert. The White Fathers, they're now called Missionaries of Africa, but they were founded by Cardinal Lavigerie and he wanted them to be, uh, he took on the local gandura that the Muslims wore and the red hat they used to use this at the beginning and to inculturate themselves. Anyway, they, the, the um, colonials had gone from Ghana, which was a rich country, had gone up as far as they, because it, it goes from almost the equator up to 11, the, dip, the top of Ghana is on the 11 degrees uh, latitude. That's the, the border. With, and of course, all the tribes are cut in half because they're on the other side of the rivers and they usually use the rivers. The river Volta is used as a... So anyway, the White Fathers came, actually came down and they came down because of the slave trade. They were saving slaves. And they came into the north of Ghana through a place called uh, Boku nor uh, Novongo, north of Novongo, which is on the east side of the Northern Territories. The Northern ter Territories in Ghana was savanna land. South of the, the, the Volta cuts across, and south of that was the um, was forest and the rich area. So the people up north were nothing, and they had nothing. Savannah, dry. And the, this particular tribe over on the northwest called the Dagaba, or Dagao, or Dagaba, we Britons call it, and they had, we had gone up, I think it was, was it 1911 or something? Uh, they had all the, the only white person there was the local DC, district commissioner. Hmm? And he was in a place called Laura, which is about five miles from the, from the border, from the, the, the Volta. So that was the only white person they'd seen. And then the white fathers came down on the the west side of Ghana, the west side of North, Northern Territories, and then they kept, they settled there, and then they knew that nobody had been over for the mission uh, missionaries on the to this the tribes on the east side, so they came across from Navongo. They came down to Navongo to save the cat with slaves to go, to, be, to have a safe set, uh, haven for slaves, and there they started a boys' school in Navongo. That was their very first school. I'm not quite sure of the dates, but it's a it's a, a hundred years ago. Because they went over, three of them went over to Jurapa, to the uh, to um, the, the the western league in twenty nine. And there, um, there was a the fellow who went there was an um, the priest who was the leader was a um, um, French American uh, French Canadian. He was an English. He was a English speaking, but he was a French Canadian. He was a McCoy, so he's English speaking, and that's why they sent him because it was English that they wanted. And they had started the school for boys on that side, and it flourished. So then they went there. So they got there, and they went to <coughs> Laura to the district commission, and he said, "Well, the best place." The central is a place called Drapa, which is 10 miles from Laura, and we go and see if you can get some land there. So they went down and uh, to the chief of Drapa, and he agreed to give them... So you can't sell land in... Not, I think it's all over Africa in the tribes. The land belongs to the, the people, so you can't sell it. So it's always on lease, whatever. Anyway, there was this little village of Drapa, and the part by where, where, where there was some quite a lot of neem trees. You didn't have trees here, but these neem trees lived, and it was supposed to be haunted for the for the chief there. So he gave that to the mission, that bit of land. It, well it, it was leased to them, you see. And there they built built the, the there were two father two priests and a brother. And so the first thing was to build the three little mud huts with thatch those for them to live in. They went, there was a rest house on the top of a little hill, little mound, because they, the, the British had done that in them, put little rest houses where the commissioners could have to while they took over the jurisdiction, because they'd taken it over and they were building roads to make it accessible. This was, because it, in just 1900, 1911 I think, they had put the 
boundaries. I'm not sure of the date, but it was 1911. I don't know what I learned in my mind. And they'd fix the boundaries with the French and the German on either side. And we had this little bit in the middle of Ghana, which is about the size of the UK, you know, that's about the size altogether. And uh, we claimed this little bit. And uh, so the British then sent commissioners up north to build roads so that they could... Uh, so they were busy, and that was why they wanted manpower for the building of the roads. So the, they gave this, the missions, they didn't mind them coming up to school because that helped develop the country. So they, <coughs> they gave this, and they built this, and the, and the priest there, Father McCoy, when he saw the state, they're very poor, very poor, and the child mortality was more than 50%, very, very high. So he went there in 30... 32, no, no, 29. They went 29. And by 32, um, they had made little inroad. They'd learnt, they'd first learnt the language. That was the main thing for them. And they still lived in these three huts. And then they started building a rectangular, or with mud bricks, making mud bricks, and building this rectangular. Five rooms downstairs, five rooms upstairs, grand on either side so that he didn't get the sun and so on. So they'd started building this. And then he said he really needed, we needed um, women, promotion of women, care for the maternity work above all. So by then he, had, he went to Rome. No, before that had happened, before he went to Rome, in the early 30s, while they were still building this and not getting anyone interested in the, in the um, religion, he, one day, while they were still had these three parts, a group of men came to him. They had had a drought for three years, and you only get one rainy season there, a season. So one evening, a group, a whole group of chiefs came to him and said to Father McCoy, um, you know, we've made all the sacrifices possible to all our gods and our gods not listen to us. You say you've got a god. Would you pray to your god that we get rain? Because our children will die. We can't go on like this. This is the third year and it hasn't rained yet. It was April and it hadn't rained. So Father McCoy said to them, well, it's not quite as easy as that. Um, you know, if you want our God to do something for you, it's best to you know something about him. So if you'd like to know something about our God, then we pray to him because you, uh, that you will have to come and know something about him. So they had a palaver. They went off and palavered whether that was worth it. And they came back and they agreed. So he said, well, come into the chapel. One of these was a chapel, just a th uh, round hut. So they, and they said, you pray. No, he said, you pray, you turn. So there they went and they sit back on their haunches always and pray. So, and they just prayed like that, like the way they do. That's to mm. beg someone to God. Uh, Namwin, that's the, the head god. Is a, 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 a na is a chief. Um, the, the win, um, win is, a, is a, one of their gods. They've got, they've got lots of gods. And, and Namwin is the main god, the chief god. So they, they beg them, oh, we want our children are dying and so on, and if we don't send the rain, we'll have it. And they prayed there, and he, then he said, he joined them and prayed. So then they went out, and they, they had to laugh together and say, well, now you, all right, well, if you, you, get, you, uh, you get rain, and then you've got to come back and, and so on. And, as we say, the miracle of the rain that went, by that evening, when they got back, every village that had sent an elder, the rain poured down. And you know how uh, how regional rains are, yeah? All the villages were drenched that sent. Well, I mean, this is an established fact there, and it just spread from there. All the villages that sent, more villages came, not only from Ghana, but across the river. It was the same tribe, the Dagabas, the, the same tribe. They came from the French side, walking 60 miles or more to, to pray for rain, and they all got rain that came. 
And the exodus was so great, the people coming to Jarapa to pray and to come back for catechism, which continued over the few years, that the documents, the French government went to Accra and said, what's happening up in the northwest? Because all the people from our part are moving over and they say it's in a religious reason, can you look into it? And they looked at it, they found what was it. So the White Fathers established a mission of just across, it's just across the border, but it's by the as crow flies about 20 miles, but it turned enough to get there. And the White Fathers established a mission in, in Dissin to stop the people coming across. Now that's established in, in the archives of there, but it, it did actually happen. Yeah, that was it. The mir they call it the miracle. He's written a book on it. Mm -hmm. Father McCoy has written it. Sit down. Yeah, but that actually happened. That was the beginning, and so the the number of converts they they came and they came and they used to come and and walk up and they put uh, put all the catechism into the local language and so on and it spread. Mm -hmm. So there were a large number of people, and then Father McCoy said, "We need to." Development to provide means because from the beginning they started giving aspirins and helping them and one of the fathers ran a dispensary like that with whatever he had. So Father McCoy in 36 by 36 he went to Rome to us, he knew us in Ghana and he begged and begged for sisters and he said well we've got to train them and we'll send them. They went eventually in 39 by the time they trained midwife and a a sister for, for teacher. So the result was that they were, fathers went in 29, 39, we actually went. They had built then, by that time, they'd built this house, on mud house, and the fathers lived in it. When they, they knew the sisters were coming, they built another house. By this time, they'd learned to taught the people to cut the laterite stone. It's a red stone, laterite. And they taught them how to cut that out of the rock and their father's house was then built in laterite stone. Ours was still the, like ever the old one, the mud. And they, then they built on a maternity, which was the first thing, all in laterite. It's still standing, that laterite thing. And so when the sisters got there in 39, <coughs> actually we, we went by the French country, left the six sisters. Uh, uh, they said that uh, it was the anniversary of our founders' birth in 39. So they made it, we, we sent them out just before the war, and that was, that was afterwards, they were cut off completely. And the anniversary, it was the 100 years centenary, so that was called the name of the foundress, Helen, and ours was called, it, um, um, when she became a nun, they took a different name in that day, Our Lady of the Passion, because that she was Mary of the Passion. So that was why that convent was called the Passion, and that, that 10 years afterwards, they. So they arrived there, six of them, one French and the others Canadian, one Irish, one Scotch, two Scots and one Irish, and two Canadian, yeah, over there, six sisters were there. And they started immediately, the maternity was there, an orphanage. So we had simple, one room, the labour room at the end, they uh, had enough for beds were but they were just wooden things and they went on the beds but otherwise they were on the floor. The next little room in between for mother for the mother uh, for the sister if she was needed to be there all the time. And then the next little room was orphans and we had it full of orphans. And that was how they started. And then they started the schools that fathers had to go out and choose the children, the girls. And they the people couldn't believe it. They knew that the government by this time had a school for boys in Laura, and the father said, Father McCoy said, they said to start a book. No, he said, I'm not starting, starting a school for, boy, for girls. And they couldn't believe it. The girls don't go to school. They couldn't believe it. And they had to go to the village, and they chose the, because no, no, no documents whatsoever. So they chose the children by their teeth. If they'd lost their first teeth. They chose the girls, and mostly it was the, the catechists who were wonderful people by this time, ten years on, 
they would got catechists in the different villages and loads of people coming to the mission. And so they chose uh, the girls, that, but it was very difficult because they didn't want to give their girls to education. The girls were made to do the work at home. So it was very difficult in the beginning. Um, by the time they got, they used to leave school, by the, they'd come and then the, the parents would stop them coming. But by the time, uh, well, when they started, then they started off with a try. They built another a school, then they, they built a school, all in mud bricks, just simple oblong rooms, holes for windows because you didn't need anything else except holes. And um, then they, the brothers started making little benches and things for them to sit on. Gradually we got chairs and things and so on. But, so they started absolutely from zero with a group of kids and of course all naked. Uh, so then and the women, when I got there in 47, I was there in 47, that was a, six, eight, eight years after the foundation, we went. The, the women, were, none of them were clothed. They all had leaves, bunches of leaves across them. And the men had like a little a little triangle, and they tucked it up here. Yeah. But otherwise, and, the cho and the, then the girls, when they came, they had nothing. And the, the, they came from, they had to go from as far as 30 miles to get the children. They were boarders, they had to be boarders, of course, otherwise they'd have got no learning at all. So they had about 20 to start with, and the little children, all they had was a, a basket made from, you know, the, 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 the stalks. They all had their, all their possessions were in a basket, and they'd walk 30 miles. So they, we only had two, two holidays a year when I got there. Yeah, and they'd come with their little baskets on their thing, and then they they learned how the women knew how to make strips. They did it for the men's loincloths of cotton, and they would they would spin the cotton with their hands themselves and weave it. And where they made bands because they only had it they would, and they sewed those bands together. So they made little skirts with the girls <laughs> with these, and. But they just put them on to come to school and to go to church. Otherwise, that was all right. And so they started off like that. And, and and what was good is that you see, we started off with English in primary one in those days. So we taught them all the time in English. So all the first ones that came were very good. And of course, they just loved to learn. And the people used to come and look in and say, what mm. are the do girls doing there? But we had to feed them, of course. Mm. And that was very difficult until we, we got the help from the uh, Americans. But do, until after the war, it was very difficult to feed the children. So mm. describe when you first got there. Yeah. Just describe your experience of being there. and When I first got there, um, we had had a long trip, well, that's a, another story on its own, and we arrived there on a Sunday afternoon in a lorry because there was a gentleman in Kumasi, a Catholic man, um, uh, uh, who used to, who was a trader, and he had, he had a, a, a lorry. And about, perhaps, perhaps it was every three months or so, he would bring up to the mission, he'd bring things from it was 350 miles to Kumasi from our place. And um, so he had sent down a lorry to meet up um, when the, my companion and I were arriving. So after a hazardous journey, eventually we arrived there on a Sunday afternoon about three o'clock in the afternoon and it was full siesta. You always make a siesta there after. Anyway, did we have a meet? There was people coming, bells were ringing, the church bell. By this time they had a, a mud church, and, but they had the bell. And the fathers came out, the father's house there, our house there, the church there, and the school there, on the big compound. So we were all there. And we had a rapturous welcome from everyone, because whenever you heard a lorry coming, that was something, everyone stopped. To, to, and, Everything stopped and we went, so they all came to the central compound. And there were plenty of neem trees there, so there was lots of shade there. 
and bang, mango trees. Quite a, and and so and of course the place that the sisters were already when I got there the sisters were already there so they all came out so we had a rapturous welcome and it was just unbelievable <laughs> you just couldn't believe it. You're hot and thirsty hot thirsty you're always thirsty <laughs> but such a welcome from these it's unbelievable and it, it was so so there was I mean there was no running water the, the girls used to we had a well in the back of our house we had a well the, the, by that time they, oh yes we had um, near the school they built two schools uh, so there was a primary block there and now they were sit, just starting off the middle block they are just plain uh, you know uh, square classrooms just like that and then at the side there they we had a compound I think they had about six huts, round huts, and the girls used to sleep on mats, like long corn stalks from the corn, and they wove those together, and they were like they, they were like a triangle, and they put part and then covered them over with the other bit. So all their things, all their clothes, whatever they had, were inside the mat, and they closed the mat as they saw it, closed the mat, and they slept with their feet like as we used the um, military used to do here with the old bell tents and with the feet towards the central pole that the, that's the way they slept that way so they'd sleep all around in a ten or so little mats folded over and the children inside but they all had their place and that was their dormitory just in the thing yeah that and so you you arrived and you you couldn't speak or no, the but you the see, there's just, and for added added complication for me was that the three of the that all the fathers were French Canadian, and they spoke French all the time, French Canadian. I didn't speak French. I learned French in school, but then you didn't speak it and didn't understand it. And um, so I arrived with a French Canadian companion. So I was lucky; at least she was French Canadian. She yeah. understood, and I found that the two sisters, the one Irish and the one Scotch, who were there then. The other two had got sick in the meantime and gone away and more French Canadian had come. So there was but in community they all spoke French because the Canadians didn't understand English and there were more Canadians than anyone. And so they either spoke Dugali, which they'd learnt the language, their own language, or they spoke French. So I remember mm -hmm. very well that my first that when they gave me a, a whole pile of, for my birthday, and a whole pile of books, different languages, because I was English speaking, and they were all could either speaking Tagali or speaking French, and the, the two English speaking ones were so used to speaking the French or Tagali that they spoke it for French or Tagali. So what? How, what, what did you? What I did you learn? I soon, soon, soon learned to chip, chip in with the French with the thing, and. And we, then when I got there, then we were supposed to have always, the first thing was to learn the language. But as often happens, I was supposed to learn the language and Dennis came to teach me the language. But the school needed a teacher. So I ended up at the beginning of my life there, not learning the language properly, because I'd been needed. And I was always saying to the children, you speak in English because that was our big thing, to speak in English and to train them in English. So so you didn't end up learning? I didn't learn the language then. I learned the language later on, but not at that stage, because it, the school was the most important. And the the, the other sister, she, was, she wasn't she was a two-year um, two train. She'd done a, a quick missionary, they had, ran a course, quick missionary course for teachers going out, and some of the School, uh, colleges here had done a year, she had just done a year. So she felt inadequate. She wasn't, but she felt inadequate. So she was just so anxious to send it over to me. Because, and then it was the British government, you see. So I had the necessary certificate. We always have to have certificates. Because then we were becoming recognised. And especially from the health point of view, because such wonderful work was done by the this um, mother country, the 
the midwife. By that time, we had a second midwife, a second uh, Canadian. So we had two nurses, midwives, and they were doing. I mean, we they had hundreds at the dispensary. That was the dispensary every morning, and the, all the maternity going on, and that was absolutely fantastic. And that was making the health improve. Very oh, much. It was no. And the father McCoy, this McCoy was such a far-seeing man. As I said, he started education for girls despite them. And then, when I got after a few years, about after I'd been there a couple of years, we'd done middle school because that was six years primary, then middle school. We said, we have to have, open a secondary school. And again, they were the gasp, the teachers, we've got no secondary school for boys here. And he said, I remember Father McCoy saying, ah, oh, he said, in years to come, you will thank me for pride, providing you with educated wives, which is exactly what happened. They're very well educated. We, we started the, the secondary school. We had great difficulty because they want the certificates. So, you know, we're up in the bush there, but you want, wanted certificates uh, up to. And they wouldn't accept it. We mm. sent Filipinos, and they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't, that, wouldn't accept there. Their certificates uh, for a BA, you had they had to have an MA. Their MA, we had to get one of our sisters from the Philippines with an MA because otherwise they wouldn't accept us headmistress with a BA from the states. Yeah. BA from the states wouldn't count. They're terrible. So uh, you arrived and you started to teach these girls. Yeah. And what age were they? The ones you were teaching. At that, um, at that time, when you arrived, at, th at that time they were they were just gone, started middle school, so they, uh, roughly they would have that they were much older actually, but they were, um, they should have been. Um, let me see, Priscilla. But we lost so many, so they were. You had bigger classes in the and uh, in the primary school, and we had uh, a couple of. Um, Gardenian teachers as well, men of course, and, uh, and then Sister Canis taught, and and uh, so that would have been, um, Martha, she would have been uh, that they must have been eight before they came to school, twelve. Um, let me think, fourteen. They would have been about sixteen. These children, and that's why we sixteen, seventeen. That's why we lost a lot mm. because they they went to mat to get married. They were mm. ready for marriage, you see. And so, actually, when in the middle school when I started, I think I only had about I think there wouldn't have been more than ten in the class then. And we got up through the middle school, and then at the end of middle school, four years, the government had a, um, a an examination, middle school leaving certificate. But we got when we got the first ones up to that stage, it would have been we got um, fifty, fifty-two. She came out fifty-two, mm. fifty-two, fifty-three. Um, what do we do with them? And we the government has a QRN course, qualified registered nurses. No midwives first. First we started with midwives. So after the, after the war, war, we got Mary Catholic, they came out from here, we got specially trained, one of our sisters from Newcastle, and she went up to um, Glasgow and did her midwifery there and came out for midwifery. Absolute whiz of a person she was for the midwifery. And she came, and when she came, she said she would start training, taking girls. So we had to ask the girls who, those who wanted to go into midwifery. So the first ones that left were trained as qualified registered mid midwives. And that's what we wanted. And in fact, one girl, Marcella, she didn't even finish. She hated school. She was in, she'd done two years in middle school, but she was always in the dispensary helping the sisters. They used to go and help the sisters, you know, the winter. And, and she, when they opened the midwifery school, she said, she went there, she never finished her, we never told anyone, she never finished her middle school. But she was, and she became the uh, matron of the hospital years after, because by, McCoy was such a wonderful man, by 50, oh, 
the beginning of the 50s, he's, the government approached us, actually, because of the work of the maternity, because we needed a hospital there in that area. Mm -hmm. the, the nearest hospital was Ma, which was 45 miles away. And, of course, they, did, they didn't have trained people, you see. And it was such a success. So Father McCoy said, we'll build a hospital. So he got the land from the, and that, then again with the government, there was a problem with the government, no water, because no water was all from wells. And Father McCoy, was, someone was allowed to tell this the other day, they didn't believe it, because they didn't believe in water diviner. I said, well, you can believe it or not, but it works. He was a water diviner, the, our bishop, he became a bishop, this priest, and he found water, because the government said we couldn't, build a hospital unless we found water. We'd have to have a, a proper water supply from the from the borehole. And they found water. They said, the government said no. So he said to find water. And he found water with his diviner. <laughs> like it like this, I've never done but I've done it now. But I'm not a water diviner, you know if you are or not. But when you are you know it. Because the, the, the thing goes right down. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So the White Fathers built a borehole and we got the water and it was, a, I think, quite a unique arrangement with the government, the British government. We, we're still under British government, we're in the 50s still. Um, we would build the hospital and run the hospital and they would pay, government assisted. Yeah. So we went ahead and they built this big hospital, which is still there. And not only that, but Father McCoy went found doctors to come and find it. And we've had a series, we had a series of absolute wonderful doctors, many of them completely voluntary. And we had an Englishman who's a wonderful fellow. We had Dutch, Quickle, and we had Dr. Archambault from the States, who's got a life on his own, another one. And he died there, and he's, he was a surgeon, and he made everyone know the Giraffe Hospital. Well, they came from everywhere. They came from the south, from the north, came from other countries to get doctor. He never stopped operating from the day he got there. He walked in. He had no, it wasn't nothing was ready. The hospital wasn't finished. He came in one Sunday, and lived in the father's house. And he said to Father McCoy, and said, well, when do we start? He said, sir, operating, of course. Everyone had to drop everything and find a place to, for him to start operating, which was uh, onto the, what had been the maternity, which was a simple thing. We had built on at the end another building as a parlour with, we had two rooms there for visitors, a room and a bedroom and a toilet there you see, and the only place from of course says, well, we'll have to take the parlour. So, an ordinary table, cement blocks by this time, but brother was busy building the hospital, we got cement blocks to rise it to the height they want. Then the light, we didn't have um, uh, uh, ele electricity, wasn't in by then, it was being planned, wasn't in. We had oil lamps, pressure lamps, because a piece of um, aluminium sheeting made a thing over the, <laughs> the operating table with an oil lamp there and he started his first operation which was a hernia operation. <laughs> and just keep, kept going. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And it was so funny because they thought he went down in, in history, the first man to be operated because the, they were there. What could you do? With a hernia, he died, so they brought him to die. So he, Dr. Harshambaugh, took, uh, did the hernia operation, and um, the girls, our girls who helped, used to have rooms in a, another place that had been for the girls that were working in there. <laughs> they were evicted, and the, the, the first patient was put there. And of course, he operated, it was just a hernia. For him it was nothing, just a hernia or what's that. So the next day he said, 
he was on his mat lying down. He said, get up. He said, I can't get up. I said, yes, you do. You get up more. And everyone thought it was a miracle. So within a few days, he went and walked home. And the people just couldn't believe it. And they, uh, I remember Dr. Archibald saying years afterwards, he said, you know, I think now I could do a, a hernia operation with a knife and fork. <laughs> he said, I've done so many. <laughs> well, he was a legend. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And he just worked until he died. Uh, yeah, he actually died there. He, he went back, he had, um, he only had one lung when he came. He'd had, he was, in, he was in the States. His dad was the surgeon, his, chief, his two brothers, one was a twin brother, and they were both surgeons. They had their own clinic, and he got TB of the, and he had one lung, and he was over in Arizona over here, and he said to God, if I get better, he said, I'll give, you can give my life, I'll give it for other people. I'm not running a posh clinic here in, in all my life, there's something else. They had their own clinic. And the, the, as I said, they were all surgeons. So, at that time, Father McCoy was over with the White Fathers looking for yeah. doctors. And the White Father, he, they got in touch and he came. And he, he, he gave his life. Actually, he got ill again, went back and was operated again. I don't know what for, but then went back to Ghana and went on to the end of his days and died there. He said, um, um, when he was when he got ill, he was still he was he had the, he had his own bungalow there. He lived there, but he ate always with the fathers. He never had his own his own. Once he had his bungalow, but he just slept there with, and ate with. He didn't have any special, you know, for him. He never took a penny. And um, he um, when he got ill, a lot, he was very sick, but he still carried on wor working. But he was still sick. And um, he said, you're not to send, for, uh, they want to send for his body. He said, no, because he's got his own work and I've got it. Anyway, they sent for the brother. And he arrived at Tamale one night. And the brother, they said, I'll take you across in the morning. And he said, no, I'd like to go tonight. So they walked and they travelled across from uh, three feet. Um, 250 miles from Tamale to our place, and he walked into the into the bedroom, and his uh, his brother was there, his twin brother was there, and he looked at him. He said, "Well, I'm so glad you've come. I'm so glad you've come because there's this operation for tomorrow morning, and this needs to be done, and I don't think I'll be well enough to do it." And he enumerated what he had to do, and he died about two hours after his brother arrived. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah, and when it came to the funeral, because well, we, because they have wonderful funerals there, you know, they, the, the dagab are special. They put the body on a pile or what they, which is just like a, a platform, and they seat the the body up, sitting up, and the funeral chant is all about what the man did in his life, or the woman did in their lives, what they did, and so if it's a teacher. He'll be sitting on the chair and he'll have a load of books beside him and things like that. And if he's a farmer, he'll have all that. And the chant is really beautiful because it's rather like, it's the same sort of chant as a, the Psalms. Mm. The Psalm says something and the second line repeats the same and, and their chants are the same. This was a wonderful man. Yes, indeed, this man was famous. And then they, and they, and they, they have the special ch singers who sing all these things, you know, they, they, they make them up for their life. And they well, the, the, the religion, this, um, the uh, Kuri, as they call it, for the, the, the uh, went on with, with Dr. Archambault so long because the people came from miles and miles. And it was, it was so retarded, it had to go on for so long. And you, they, they bury them very quickly. But he's buried there in the hospital, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. telling me that story. Absolute love. This is really well known. Shambo. Ash and his name was Ashambo. There was also Dr. Shambo. Dr. Shambo. <laughs> so when you started teaching, hmm? what was your relationship like with the with the girls you were teaching? 
Oh, they were just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Because the children all want, always wanted to learn. They wanted to learn. And so they were so anxious to learn anything, and they were so cooperative in every way. No problem at all. I had one interesting experience with a girl, though, Mary Emily, about understanding their the mentality. And th this girl, uh, Priscilla, was one of the eldest ones, and she went on, she became a m midwife, and so on. But Priscilla was very clever, and she always was top of her class as, as ever. And um, she she really um, was a very intelligent, lovely person. And um, that was one thing I learned. She, one day, she, um, one end, end of term, end of year, she was not, she, she wasn't top. And she was so upset that she wasn't top. And I felt that for my lesson as uh, my, as a teacher, I will never in my life give full marks to a, any pupil so that they don't know how to fail. She was so upset, that girl. It was quite hard to get her over it. So that was one lesson that I learned from the girl. And another lesson was there was a problem between them because they would insult each other. And I said, Maria, and this girl was Maddie Emily. She never finished her education. She did, she left. But Maddie Emily taught me a lesson. So I, I was saying, well, look, Mary, it doesn't matter, you know. You know, you have to forget it, you know. And she looked at me pityingly, and she said, Sister, you don't understand black girls. We can never forget anyone who's done us harm. I said, you've got a lot to learn. And it's very hard for, I think, any primitive society. It's the same with basic Irish as well. They can never forget. No. It's, I think it's primitive societies and they're closed in. They keep, and we see it the same in history, don't we? They hold on to the... Hmm. It's like it's a privilege that we've got to be able to get over things. Yeah. Because not everything is a life-threatening no, no. experience. No, no, no. But I think it's essentially a Christian, I think it's a Christian virtue that. But others don't have that. Mm. Uh, I mean, that really has to come from a, a, a merciful and loving God. Yeah. Mm. Because I met somewhere the other which is off this point at all, but of all the institutions, uh, if you think of any institution, they all have to have a means of punishing Evil, yeah. When things go wrong, you've got to have a correction. Hmm? But the Catholic Church is only the, the only institution that has a, a forgiveness and a restitution system. I only read that last week, so I thought it was a very good point. All the other civic and so, on, but the, and they they haven't learned that. But that girl hadn't learned that. But it's, I remembered her reflection and how important it was that they had to learn how to forgive. Yeah. It wasn't a thing that was already... In their culture. Whereas you'd been brought up with well, forgiveness. Pardon? We, I had, yes. Mm. But that's because we're Christian, that's, mm. yeah, yeah. So that was something they had to learn mm. as, yeah, for, for a different culture. Mm. It's very difficult. We have to understand these things, yeah. Mm. Since um, independence, they, we have had no, we've had coups, but almost bloodless coups. Mm. And they are very peace loving. And another very important thing that I think, I don't know if it's true, but it's my, my belief, that the Ghanaians were so wise, and I think history bears this out, when it came to independence and what was going to be the official language, and because we've got so many different tribes, they decided on English, and that unifies them, and politically 
in other countries like Kenya now, it's disastrous still because you've got so much tribal because of language. But the Ghanaians, I think the French have, I don't know what they're, how that's gone for them, but for, I only know that Ghana, when they made that decision in 57 when they became, I thought that was the wisest thing. They were very wise. And what, of colonials, what we did, you can complain and see the, the, the bad side, but we had a very good side in as much as we um, formed leaders. We had a, a um, university in, in, and all the um, first army, Santos, were all over, trained over here. And the dis in other countries you see the disaster and the, and the way things have gone, but not in Ghana. So uh, what what were the negatives of what were the negatives of the colonial? Uh, well, a lot. Uh, well, um, primarily, I think um, um, commercially, the taking on the money out of the mm. uh, out of the country, and and what I understand also because when I was in. Um, when I did my uh, catechetical course in in, in in Brussels, we had uh, sociology. We had a very good sociologist, and he, most of them in Belgium had been um, missionaries as well. So they weren't. They were talking from an experience, and I just remember this man explaining to us so well that they, you know they they came over and showed us showed them how to do soap making and, and factories and so on, and then selling their things. Um, the European uh, cheaper than that, and so cutting under. Mm. He said we, and this was way back in the seventh, sixties, sixties. I remember him saying this: we're not doing any good commercially. We're we're, we're pretending to do good, but we're not. So it was sort of give with this hand in a and humanitarian sense, and then take away the yeah. money. Yeah. Day, and we had a big family get together as well. And there was one thing I, I just gave a, a little talk about it, you know, and I just sent especially to the this young. Was it your birthday? Pun? Your birthday. It was my 90th birthday, right. yeah. And um, I just said, especially to the young ones, I said, look here in this hot, in this place here together. The, the, for me, there are very three important things in your life. It was Mags as well who said the same thing. And you just hold on to them. Your faith, your, your family, and your friends. Hold on to all of them. Here in this room is Eva, uh, the Roberts family that we knew when we were children. They married at my cousin, into my cousin. We knew we children. Eve, who was in secondary school with me. People that were in college with me, and although I went all over the world, and these and hold on to them because these are what matters at the end of your life the rest can go but hold on to that i'll take that yes yeah. good advice it's, it is and we laugh we say three f's you need three f's <laughs>